Today I'd like to unveil the beautiful women in Islam, uh, specifically in how they're, regards to how they're seen in the Quran. So let's start with this. Quran Surah 2 al bara the Heifer, 222 to 223 A is the verses. They ask thee concerning women's courses, that is a hurt and a pollution. Thus keep away from women and their courses, and do not approach them until they are clean. When they have purified themselves, then you may approach them in any manner, time, or place ordained for you by Allah. For Allah loves those who turn to him constantly, and he loves those who keep themselves pure and clean. Your wiser is a tilth unto you, so approach your tilth when and how you will. Now this verse is saying your tool should be brought to your wife as a hoe to a field with you in complete charge of the whole experience. So in other words, rape your wife if you wish and have her physically whenever you want. It would seem if you're a Muslim husband, you can unveil your wife whenever you wish. Now some respectable Muslims seem to think that this verse is merely saying don't take her in the butt. But that's silly because the main thing is saying don't get blood on you from her courses, which is meaning menstruation. But if you really can tell your wife when and how you will, then probably the butt is lawful. Uh, and likely during that time frame as a menstruation. Now, obviously, Muhammad wouldn't care if the first experience had blood because he did marry a six-year-old and consummated the marriage at nine years old for little Aisha, who was, you know, barren her whole life, which is the medical response to repeated early sexual violation. Now, if a wife is to be tilled, meaning horror, as you wish, then one would think that uh, they're not seen as one to cling to or to desire relative to uh, seeing the comparison you fam the family just came from. And sure enough, the Quran seems to show that divorce is common. So listen to this. Quran 2, 229. A divorce is permissible... <clears throat> twice. Beyond that, they should completely separate. It isn't lawful for a man to take back gifts of dowry unless both parties are fearful that to not do so would be beyond the limit of Allah. If you do and do dare to feed, fear the ability to keep the limits ordained by Allah, then let it be no transgression. They that transgress are in the wrong. It seems to me these silly Muslims' divorce is a method of showing the stupid women how they're, low they're about to be in society if they don't grovel they get back in good graces with the Muslim man. Uh, so Muslim men must be hell on earth for a woman, especially if uh, during the time frame he's angry, uh, you should be thinking about giving back the dowry gift to him so he's not uh, going to sin against you. But anyways, Quran 2, 235, there is no blame on you if you make an offer of betrothal and love with the woman. Allah knows that you love them in your heart. But make no secret binding contract with them, nor fulfill the oath of marriage till the time prescribes come to pass. Now this verse is saying that a man loves a woman he marries. And, and that sounds nice enough at first blush, but do you have to tell the Muslim who actually loves a woman that he shouldn't consummate the marriage until he's married? <clears throat> In other words, no sex until marriage? And then again, look at America, it seems the world's heading to being equal to a Muslim man. But it wasn't so before, you know, there was a day when there were real men. And it seems back from the beginning, though, Islam had none. Now the focus on women is a little hazy at times in the Quran. It seems to show that women really aren't worth much, even when the Quran does want to focus on, on them. And the above ought to be proof enough, but notice how the focus goes now. Quran Surah 4 and Nissa, the women, verse 3. If ye fear ye be unable to deal justly with orphans, then marry the women of choice up to two, three, even four. Yet if ye truly fear justice to their orphans, children by the man you have slain, uh, then marry but one, as indeed your right hand possesses them, and then at least you'll, it'll be suitable and no injustice. You see, if you kill a man, then you should be able to give a betrothal price from the dead man to his wife, or one of his daughters, and then marry her, so she could be told, you know, when and how you wish. But then they're all your right-hand possession, you know. So we're just talking about marrying four of them if you can't do justice to orphans. I mean, obviously you could go above four if you can do better to the orphans. But anyways, it's saying, you know, just marry two, three, or four if you're fearing justice to the orphans. But then again, if you really fear justice to the orphans, just marry one. So, you know, that comment about, isn't it wonderful how the Quran is the only book that says marry just one? I mean, basically what it's really talking about is can you take care of the children of the people that you just killed? But, but in any case... <clears throat> The point is this, though, you know, you can just give a small gift to the ones you're not going to marry, and then, you know, they're lawful for you, them, for you to have. So the focus, though, really isn't the women, though. The focus is to just make sure there's some justice for the orphans and the dead man. Now, Quran 4.4 says, Give the woman their dowry as only a free gift, but if they had a pleasure gift portions back, then take it and enjoy it with good cheer. Now, ain't that a... You know, you just gave a woman a dowry from a dead man that she once knew as her dad or her husband. But the verse, uh, as the, this is a verse directly before we're saying that. But now if the lady knows what's best for her, she ought to, you know, for the house she's about to live in, she ought to give back some of the dowry, you know? Islam, and specifically Quran 4.4, really sucks for the ladies. Quran 4.11, Allah directs you as regards to children to the male, a portion to equal that of two females. If there are only daughters, the share of the daughters is two-thirds, and for one daughter, only half. Then the parents of the hair gain a third, or a half, or the wife only but a sixth of the inheritance. It seems if you're a daughter, you inherit less. But, you know, if your dad and mom only had daughters, then your male cousins will be walking around with your inheritance. More Islam for the women, obviously, then, in other words. Quran 4, 15 to 16. 
If any women are lewd by the witness of four witnesses, then they will be confined to their house until they die, or unless Allah ordained for them a right way. If two men among you are guilty of lewdness, then punish them both. Should they repent, then leave them alone. Allah can forgive. Now what this is saying is if you're a lesbian, hope to hell someone goes into your house by force and takes you by right hand possession, or you're going to die. And for the homosexual male, it's best to repent, you know, or to seek a woman to avoid the stone that's going to come your way. But note though, the lesbian needs to find salvation by a man who behaves towards her, while a man can save himself by renouncing homosexuality. Uh, homosexuality. So again, you know, for women, it's serious trouble in Islam. Quran 424, also prohibited women already married except those whom your right hand possesses. Thus has Allah ordained for you all things lawful, provided you offer a gift from your property. Thus you can derive benefit from them, and there is no blame. Now if you desire a married woman in Islam, the method is simple. Kill the husband, take the woman by right hand possession. Ain't Muhammad wonderful making all things lawful? Quran 425, if any have not the means wherewith to wed the free believing women, meaning daughters of the book of the Bible, then wed them by right hand possession. For Allah doth approve of your faith, and ye are close and kindred if they are owned by right hand possession of another, then ask for the hand to pay the betrothal to your brethren for them. Though they must be chaste, not having previous lovers, if you marry one taken by another Muslim's right hand, in other words, practice self-restraint among the war booty. Now, if you see a beautiful woman not married, but you can't come up with a betrothal price, the answer is simple. See verse before. Oh, do I have to tell you about it? Okay, it's kill the dad and take the daughter by right hand possession. Now, if a Muslim man can beat you to it, and he's already got them by right hand possession, then marry them only if he hasn't had his way with them. In other words, don't marry a Jewish or Christian woman who was had by Islam and made into a harlot. You know, go find another woman by right hand possession who's a virgin and, and pay the betrothal price for her. Otherwise, just you know, pay for one night and get it over with, and then proceed on. Quran 434. None of the protectors and providers of women, as Allah has given one strength over another. Thus are the righteous women devoutly obedient and guard women without what Allah would have them guard. Of those women you fear disloyalty or ill conduct, admonish them first, refuse them rest and admonishment, and beat them. If they return to obedience, seek nothing further, for is not the Most High the Most High? Uh, Allah, by the way, equals the Most High. What this is saying is if you watch a Muslim man beat the hell out of his wife, you're seeing himself show himself like Allah would be in Islam. And if you see a man yell at his wife and it doesn't work so he yells at her without ceasing, then to make her submit, well what you're seeing is something like what Allah would be like in Islam. Quran 4, verse 60 to 62. Hast thou not turned thy vision to those declaring they believe in the revelations and yet have come to thee as their judge? When they are but crooked, desiring a judgment for them, reject them, and let Satan have them to be led. When it was said to them, Come, to what has led, and to his messenger, they were the ones as hypocrites who turned away in disgust. Now that they are in misfortune because of the deeds of their own hand they've done, now they come swearing by Allah, give them no goodwill or conciliation. What this is saying is if a high-standing Christian man is demanding his daughter be safe from a poor-ass Muslim, don't you dare rule in favor of him in court, because he should have joined Islam and become a Muslim if he wants justice in court. Quran 4, 65-69, But no, by the Lord they have no faith until they make thee the judge in all their disputes between them, and their souls give no resistance against any of your decisions, and they accept it with the fullest conviction. For if we demand they sacrifice their lives, very few of them would do it. If they had done what was told them, it would have been best for them, and they would have strengthened their faith. We should now then give them the presence of a great reward, and we should have shown them a straight path to Allah. All who obey Allah and the messengers are in the company of those of whom Allah's grace is bestowed. Prophets, believers, witnesses, the righteous, a glorious fellowship. Now this is saying, if one joins Islam, it sounds like it's pretty likely one of them has to join the army to subjugate other people. But again, uh, this man here in court, he's avoided Islam. Therefore, he needs to give in to Muslims in all things, and thus be in court, uh, you know, like this. It shows he hasn't even submitted. So tell that dummy the only sure way for him to make it in heaven is death and the cause of Allah. For his faith is likely to be weak if only years after finding out what a crappy hand he's going to be dealt with in this Islamic society. He says the Shahada, that's a false one. You know, if he it only dies in the death of Allah, does he really have a chance of paradise for a man like that. Quran 4, 74-76 Let them that fight for the cause of Allah sell the life of this world for the hereafter. To him who fighteth in the cause of Allah, whether slain or victory, a soon reward of great price. Why not fight for the cause of Allah, and those ill-treated being weak men, women, and children crying, O Lord, rescue us from this town, these oppressors, and raise up for us one who will protect and provide. Those who believe fight for the cause of Allah, and those who reject fight, fight, fight for the cause of the evil one. So fight ye against them, allied with Satan, for he is feeble indeed. Now what this is saying is that weak men, women, and children in non-Islamic territories are hoping one day for a Muslim come and slay all those strong men of the city, and then the Muslim conquerors can become their providers. Now, if you believe that ever happened in the history of the world, ha, I don't. 
Anyways, Quran 4, 127 to 129. Concerning women, Allah doth instruct them what was once in the book concerning orphans of women on whom you do not give a full price of wives, but desire as such. They are the children who are weak and oppressed. So see to it you do them some justice. Allah will see this deed. If a wife fears cruelty or desertion by the husband, there is no blame on them if they ask for a settlement, you know, for the orphan. To be given as men's souls will be greedy, but practice self-estraint for Allah. He will see your good deed. You could never have been fair and just among all women, even if you desire it. Still, leave not a woman altogether without. Come to a friendly understanding. Again, this is for the orphan's sake. This is saying that a Muslim man should will obviously give greater gifts to a wife as almost, and almost nothing to women they just take by right-hand possession. So, in other words, what it's saying is, is that, you know, those women who you never did marry but you took by war, you know, give something for the orphan. This is because, you know, Muhammad was an orphan. In other words, he's saying, throw them a bone, you know, those orphans. You know, the woman is not the focus, again, so much as the male orphans, who, like Muhammad, need a guiding hand. Because, you know what happens, obviously, to the female orphans. They're either going to be a wife, a harlot, or a concubine, you know, and then they'll get something, obviously, then, because whoever's using them as a tilt. Quran Surah 3, Al-Azib, the Confederates, verse 50. O Prophet, to you is lawful the wives of whom thou hast paid the dowry, and whom the right hand possesses out of the spoils of war that Allah assigned to you. Also daughters of paternal uncles and aunts, and daughters of maternal uncles and aunts who travel with thee, and all believing women who dedicate their soul to the Prophet, if the Prophet wished it to fulfill by marriage. For as of thee and thee alone among believers, we know what we have appointed for them as to their wives, and to whom their right hand possesses. Therefore there should be no more difficulty for thee, for Allah is merciful. Here the Quran is clarifying that Muslims sh shouldn't uh, have sex with their first cousins, but clearly the Quran had to clarify it's okay for Muhammad. And, and I'm sure it was also probably... Uh, lawful for all of his illustrious family of Banu Hashem before the Quran came. But anyways, Muhammad came from uh, people who had run the Kaaba in the Middle East long before Muhammad arrived on the scene. And so it goes without saying, though, that you know the Christian women taken in war were for Muhammad if they didn't want to die anyways, and that was obviously his right-hand possession. And then other Muslim men also enjoyed the same right, which is the right-hand possession, because the, the Quran says, you know, Muhammad, you gave it to them. Anyways, Quran Surah 65, Al-Talaq, Divorce, Verse 4. Divorce among women have passed the age of monthly courses and give the prescribed period. If in doubt, it's three months. For those who have never had courses also, for those who are great with child, the period is until they deliver their burdens. Allah will make a path easy for them who fear him. Now this is saying if you divorce an old lady or one like, say, Aisha, who had never had a period, shoot for about three months uh, to give her a place to figure out where she's going to go now that she's got to survive, now that she doesn't have you anymore. If they're pregnant, you know, just wait until after the birth you know, because this isn't the 21st century that Muhammad's living in. If you're a Muslim man in America, obviously, today, then you're probably not marrying the women that you get pregnant if you just want to get rid of them while they're pregnant. But anyways, Muhammad didn't want those Muslims looking too bad, basically, to other people. So he says, don't leave a woman while she's pregnant, you know. But I don't think he'd have bothered with this verse in today's world, because, you know, he was shooting for a bare minimum treatment of women, as far as I can tell. And so those Muslims would probably just fit right in, and no one's none the wiser if they threw them out while pregnant. Anyways, thankfully... We have a stoop to killing people, you know, to pay a dowry for a woman in the household or the, of the man we just killed. But, you know, in Islam and in the Quran, it's just fine and dandy. So any woman humbled or married to a Muslim man is a Muslim, you know, in case you didn't know. So, you know, welcome to Islam. Let's commence with the unveiling of the beautiful women in Islam, which is what they are once you get to the unveiling part.